you know they did a survey not all that long ago and there were some interesting results not really surprising in my opinion but interesting nonetheless and I just wanted to do the biggest takeaway basically the headline out of this survey was most young men are single most young women are not the researchers did some survey and they said that over 60 percent of young men i'm not sure how they're defining what young men is what the age bracket is but I would guess it would probably start off at dating age 18 and upwards. Over 60% of young men are single. And only 30% of young women are single. And they think this is further eroding the social norms and fabrics of the American young male in modern society. Now, I'm not going to say I have all of the necessary kind of reasons and rationales for why this might be the case, but you all, I've definitely got a couple of inclinations I wanted to run by based off of observation. The reason I said I'm not surprised is because, you know, during COVID, this is when I first started to notice a lot of things. You know, when you're kind of always running here, there, and everywhere, which I think most of us were doing prior to COVID, we really didn't have time to really objectively analyze ourselves and the wider society. But then when we sort of kind of were quarantined, as they call it, some people say it was a lockdown, some people say it was a quarantine, whatever you want to call it, totally floats your boat. When we were in quarantine, you had time to slow down, stop and smell the roses, so to speak. For me, I did a lot of internal observations. I kind of ceased and desisted some bad habits. We won't go into all of them, but it was a time for reflection and change. And whatever you want to say, a lot of folks did change. Some folks changed for the better. Some folks changed for the worse. This is a fact. Now, one fundamental change I saw, regardless of age, with men. Then we'll talk about women. And we'll start off with men. One fundamental change I saw with men, and this was a gradual thing, but now it's super pronounced. A lot of men were douchebags, assholes. Yeah, maybe they were like that before COVID, but a lot of them during and now the present day really, really, are atrocious. So ladies, I totally get what you're saying and what you've gone through. Yeah, I see it big time in our society, especially in American society. Many of you know that we've been able to travel and traverse during COVID. And I've been to many different societies, witnessed many different cultures. And really, Men, American men, are the worst of all the men. They're the worst. Completely. You know, 
oh, you know, I'm gonna like this, but this is a bitter pill to swallow. And so you can turn it off now, but I'm not gonna go easy at all. Folks, and I think a lot of this had to do with our leader at the time, Donald J. Trump. Men in America were completely atrocious. Their behavior, it was abhorrent. Not all, so I don't want to generalize, but a good chunk, a good majority, I would say a good majority, were awful in terms of how they took it. You know, at the onset of COVID, it was men who were saying there was no virus and they weren't willing to do any type of restrictions. You know, they told the general society, for your protection, please socially distance, wash your hands, and if you're going out into the general public, wear a mask. The individuals who had a problem with all of that, by and large, were men. Yes, they did. And I'm thinking to myself, well, you know, that's just reckless. It's going to cause very bad circumstances. This is what I'm thinking. Because if you're that completely reckless and you don't know what it is, and at this time none of us really knew, and still to this day don't have a lot of information about COVID, but I'm like, when something is brand new and they're telling you it's novel, and it's dangerous, even if you don't have all the information, I'm going to be pretty reticent to not just disregard being protective of myself. But men, oh boy, they were like, it doesn't exist. And then when it came around eventually to it does exist, they were like, it's like the common cold and flu. Even though people who were contracting COVID were like, no, we've had the common cold and common flu all this time, and it's never been this bad. And so that was the first thing with me, the denial. The denial of something that was new and novel. And then it spiraled into this kind of blatant conspiracy theory. Now you always had the internet was full of conspiracy theories. Prior to COVID, I'm not going to lie, the interwebs were conspiracy theory land. But when we were on lockdown and quarantine, the conspiracy theories just ballooned. Who was the provider and the leading driver of all of these conspiracy theories? Men. Yeah, you saw women latch on to it, but that was only after men were espousing it non-stop. And it was just so many different conspiracy theories. And you know, with conspiracy theories, the reason I tell you all, for you young people, they're dangerous, is because most conspiracy theories are based in some type of violence. Like, it's never some conspiracy theory where there's something good occurring. It's always something bad or dire. And so, the solution to this was violence for men. And so you saw men go outside and do what? One of the first things that folks did, if you recall, it was in Michigan. You had the president send out a tweet. He said, liberate Michigan. And you had this group, a small group of men who got together, concocted this plot to try to kidnap the female governor of Michigan. Yeah, they wanted to kidnap her and then torture her and do all kinds of sick stuff. I'm not going to go into details. But I was like, I'm sitting here observing the spiral. You know how when you're looking at someone or something just spiraling out of control? That's what we were witnessing at the onset of COVID. 
And at that time, I didn't broadly think that it was a, going to be a problem entirely with me. And then we started seeing, because folks were locked down, we started seeing less and less of mass shootings. But the reports of domestic violence were through the roof. Yes, yeah, femicide went through the roof. So people internally in their house, now that they had to be with each other, they couldn't put up with each other. The numbers are greater. I tell you all this all the time. Men lie, women lie, but numbers do not lie. When folks had to put up with each other, divorces went up. Domestic violence went up. And so because we were so busy, we really didn't know each other. That really was the case. And when folks got to know each other, they were like, Phew. not everyone, but a lot of people. They were like, Phew. I'm in a relationship with a monster. I'm married to a monster. Yeah. And so that was another component of this. So I want to know how many, and this is something that wasn't ascertained in the survey, how many of those men, whatever age they were, were already in relationships, but they broke up the relationship because whoever their partner was couldn't deal with their bullshit anymore. Yeah, it was a lot to deal with. Granted. Everybody was going through it. But I really think men took it the worst. Yeah, they took it the worst. They had the worst reactions to just about everything across the board. And then you get to all these fringe, far out, really crazy, bonkers, and violent conspiracy theories. I'm talking about things like COVID being a biological weapon. QAnon, people trapped in pizza parlors, eating babies. It's all of these things being perpetuated by men. Yeah, all of this violence just out there on the internet. And then we started seeing folks do all kinds of things in law enforcement, a profession dominated by men. You had the LMPD just break into Breonna Taylor's home and lynch her. You had people just taking justice into their own hands, vigilantism, the McMichaels and Roddy Brown in Brunswick, Georgia. Yeah, and then you had what happened with Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Kyle Rottenhouse, a.k.a. Rittenhouse. We say Rottenhouse because the whole house is rotten. Yeah. Yeah, he lied about everything. You know, Folks will talk about Carly Russell and chastise her, and rightfully so. But Rittenhouse, he lied about everything, and he murdered two people. And he's not in prison. Yeah, he's not in prison. So I don't know how these folks who are conservative can have so much of a problem with Carly Russell and her lying. She didn't murder anyone. Granted, she committed fraud, defrauded people, had people worried to death about her. But she didn't do what Kyle Rittenhouse did, which was travel from one state to another to murder two people. Yeah. And so you start to see this type of poison infesting young men where they feel this type of violence is something to be cheered and applauded. And so when the Kyle Rittenhouse case was going on, that was something we paid a lot of attention to on the interwebs. And let me tell you some of my observations. A lot of the young people who were cheering on what Kyle Rittenhouse did were young men. And I was like, this is going to be problematic. Because it's going to set up this psychological problem that we're going to see fester and ripple out into the society. That people think that the only way to justify their beliefs, their philosophy, their principles, their ideology, is to committing violence against someone else. 
Now Donald Trump as president was stoking and provoking this for his own ego and his own, well, personal gain. Because he was grifting off of it the whole time. But I was like, it's going to have wider ramifications for me down the road. Because this is not something that's charming. This is not something that's flattering. This is not something that's attractive. But to a handful of other people. Yeah. So I said, this is going to create a wedge in the society between men and women. And what happened? During that time, arguments started to occur and erupt on the on the internet. Men started blaming women for societal issues. Women started blaming men for societal issues. But the violence predominantly was coming from men. And then you started seeing women. Here's where we have to be equal and honest. You started seeing women, predominantly white women, going outside in public, misbehaving. The whole term caring came about during COVID. You had a handful of women who didn't want to abide by their COVID restrictions, and they clowned and misbehaved. And so men said, okay, we've been clowning. We're happy you're on board. But really think about this. They miscalculated something. That was really a smaller percentage of women than what they thought it was. And those women are the same women who were already problematic prior to COVID. Yeah, Karen was a thing prior to COVID. We just didn't see it pronounced in the society as much. But then when COVID occurred, we had time to look and reflect and sit back and see it. So men took it that as a sign that, oh, we can continue our atrocious ways and really double down on it. To the point where now men are just complete douchebags. All right, they're insufferable douchebags. Yeah, I'm just going to be honest with you. The misogyny, the sexism, that's not appealing to anyone. Even a Karen, believe it or not. Yeah, they can't even find a young Karen that that's appealing to. Because they're going to be running and wanting to lecture the young Karen. Being like, you can't do this with your body. And you can't dress like this. And you can't be this way. And that's just not appealing to anyone anymore. And so now you've got a complete imbalance. Because they miscalculated and saw those Karens outside and said, that's a representation of the majority of women. When it wasn't, it was a tiny percentage. Most women were very cautious. They didn't come out the house. A lot still haven't come out their houses. They're still scared of COVID. Yeah, this is a fact. People don't want to talk about it, but yeah, it's a fact. A lot of people still didn't come out. And now the reason why most people don't come out is because they look at the society and it's chaos. Yeah, it's complete chaos. And most of that chaos is driven by men. See, we have to be honest. Most of the chaos now in society is driven by men who've gone completely bonkers and crazy. They can't be reasoned with let alone be in relationship with. Yeah, I wouldn't recommend it. It's dangerous. A lot of these young men are dangerous. Women instinctively know that. And they're not going to be in any type of relations with them. You've got this whole entire incel movement on the internet. It was always there. But you know, you had... The whole MGTOW thing blow up during COVID. Men supposedly going their own way. And then that morphed into relationship advice. And the relationship advice was crazy. I'm not going to lie to you all. It was crazy. We were sitting there watching all of this trans transfold right before our eyes. Yeah, I watched all of it. Some of these relationship experts advisors they went from being 
what they consider game kind of gamers kind of they know how to speak game to just being straight up haters yeah one minute they were oh i can get a lot of numbers and i can go on a lot of dates and that was what they were telling people originally to be they morphed and transformed over to they're a high value man and these women nowadays they're this and they're that and we don't want to date them because we're high value men yeah rest in peace they mention him from time to time rest in peace to kevin samuels but i thought it was bullshit what he did yeah and you you know we go way back so i remember kevin samuels when he was selling the clothes and doing all that on the internet selling the perfumes and you know he was struggling and then he morphed into this high value dude and he started preaching these very toxic eurocentric philosophies yeah very insidious type of relationship advice that i don't agree with i was just watching it and you know they take it off every time it gets put on the internet but somebody called into his show i'm not going to tell you all they called into the show and they said okay if you want to have it that way where you're high value like can we talk about from the opposite sex how you all you can't get hard you need to take viagra you can't stay hard and you all remember he said get off my show some of you don't know what i'm talking about this is ancient history rest in peace to kevin samuels but i didn't agree with that I thought it was going to set a trajectory negatively and it did. You know, you can have lasting ramifications and impact long after you're gone. So you got to be very careful what you put out into the universe. Yeah. So I didn't agree with that, but there's a lot of philosophies and principles I don't personally agree with. People have a right to espouse what they believe themselves. That's everyone's right. But I was like, this is going to have detrimental effects because it's going to teach young people that somehow money, money, the amount of money you have in your bank account is more important than whether you have chemistry or love for an individual. When you talk about high value net worth individuals, in this case, it was men talking about how they're high value men. You completely erase the equation of love. Yeah. If I want to just be in a relationship with you because of your bank account, I'm going to scam you. I'm going to be a scam artist. And so women were like, okay, we'll just do the scam artist thing. We'll just hook up with some guys with money and we'll scam them. And that's not necessarily the greatest thing for women to have done, but I'm just telling you that's what occurred. Yeah. So you had all of this fuck shit going on. And that even more drove a wedge between men and women. To the point where now it's just completely crazy. Yeah, it's completely crazy. Yeah, nobody wants to talk to anybody. And I don't blame them, because it's been hard feelings, yeah. It's bad blood. You know, Taylor said, now we have bad blood. Yeah, it's true. Because people weren't thinking long term. They were only thinking short term. How is this going to impact me personally in the short term? But they weren't thinking about long term, how this is going to impact younger people in general that's why i really always try to think broadly 
I have to try to think and expound on things long term. I can do the short term thing easily. But I don't think that's going to have lasting effects in a positive way for the general society long after we're gone. So I have to think, what's going to be the most positive thing long after we're gone? And others might see this or view it. What are they going to think then and forever? You know, because people will come after you're gone and twist and dissect what you said, what you did. This is a fact. They do this for everyone. And so for the society's sake, I don't want to be so short-sighted that we don't look at the long term of this. And this is fair. I feel as though a lot of the responsibility, a lot of the culpability for this division came from men. When they started that whole men going their own way, a lot of those men was bitter. What were they bitter about? Well, most of them had gone through divorces. And they were in child custody cases. And they were battling with the court system about alimony and child support. And so whatever they were espousing was based off of primarily their experience. Their one negative experience. But they were willing to speak more broadly about women in general and say that women are no good, they're this, they're that. And so, of course, you're going to naturally have a backlash when people feel they're being vilified collectively as a group, there's going to be a backlash. So it was natural for women to say, well, you know, you just don't want to take care of your children. You just don't want to provide you any type of substance to provide for my children. And that's what occurred for a long time. But now you all, it's gotten really sort of kind of petty. Yeah, it's gotten petty now. The younger folks that are on the internet now, they don't even argue about those type of things. Yeah. Let me tell you what the younger folks are arguing about. This is crazy. So younger men nowadays want to argue about just broadly speaking that women are fundamentally wired to be progressive. Now whether that's true or not, it's debatable. Because what younger men see as being progressive, well, younger women don't see it that way. Younger women see it as being about sovereignty and autonomy. So if you're like, I'm against women doing or having any reproductive care because they're murderers. If that's your starting point, then women are going to be like, you know, it's our body. We do what we want to do with our body. Yeah. So I think based off of people's vantage points, the argument can get kind of corrosive real quickly. And because there wasn't too much groundwork productively laid down by the adults supposedly in the room, you can't blame the youth for taking an argument and totally distorting it, now to the point where it's out of proportion and out of whack. Yeah, I blame a lot of the adults for that. A lot of people will say, look at the youth argument. It's crazy, and this is problematic, and young men, but you... Older adult men, you're responsible for that. Yeah, in essence, you're responsible for that. Because the lack of respect for women has been educated and it comes from you to them. Yeah. And you older women, the lack of respect by younger women towards men in general in our society, that comes from you. You're the adult. Even if you disagreed with one another, there was a way to disagree. And it got totally disrespectful. And now it's predicated on hatred. Yeah, it's predicated on hatred. Younger women can't stand younger men. 
and younger men can't stand younger women. And because the adults had a disagreement, they poisoned the well, as they used to say. Yeah. Now, this survey, I didn't really look into the background data of it. I didn't have time to do it. You all know I don't really do relationships or any of that kind of thing. It's not my cup of tea. Every now and then we'll talk about it. We talked about matchmakers and gave them some tips and trades recently. But I really don't do these relationship things. But somebody said these are important societal topics. And I agree, they are important societal topics. So that's the only reason why I show any interest in discussing it. They're broadly societal topics. And when something becomes a societal topic or a societal problem, we try to kind of have commentary on it. We might not always find a solution, but we'll give it our try. We'll give it the old college try, as they say. Now, here's where it's interesting to me. If you have 60% plus of young men who are not in a relationship, and you only have 30% of young women who aren't in a relationship, that's a huge gap. So my first thought is, where are all of those young women? Who are they in a relationship with if they're not with the young men? See, this was my first kind of like, the numbers don't match. There's a mismatch here. Because that's a wide gap. That's like a 30% gap. If 60% of young men aren't in any relationship, but only 30% of young women aren't in any relationship, that's a 30 point difference. Where is that gap being made up? I did some sleuthing, prying around. As it turns out, this survey might not be as accurate as it's being depicted. Let me explain. A lot of young women are saying they're in a relationship. In theory, they're in a relationship. You know, if I have a friend and I haven't you know, really been with anybody for a while, and the friend is somebody that I hang out with, well, now I can classify that friend as being in a relationship with that person. And you know, oftentimes women will say they're in a relationship just because they don't want to admit they're single too. So they'll be like, I'm seeing this person, but technically they're really single, but they're seeing someone. Men don't answer surveys like that. If they're seeing somebody, they're saying, I'm not in a relationship because I'm just seeing the person. If they've officially committed, then they'll say, I'm in a relationship. So women don't answer the questions the same way. And I thought the survey didn't really pick up that in essence. That's point one. Point two, this one is starting to be seen in the data. Younger women are identifying more as being bisexual. Now, hold up a minute before everybody freaks out. You know, all of these baby boomer women and gen x women are freaking out because they're like oh my goodness my daughter is with another girl as though that's a horrible thing but you know some of these boomer women you know they have certain notions they'll be like that's the most terrifying thing and then you'll ask them did you have good experiences with men oh no the men i've been with were mistreated me and I'm like so why are you happy that why aren't you happy that your daughter is with someone regardless of their gender who makes them happy 
then you kind of get silent. People have phobia about changes in the society. I know. It's a real thing. Anyway, before you freak out, just because someone identifies as being bisexual does not, I might have to repeat this multiple times, does not mean that they actually engage in bisexual actions. Right? Okay, a lot of boomers and Gen Xers, because they don't I understand the spectrum, can't wrap their mind around this. You can have feelings or emotions for somebody of the same sex, but not engage in sexual activity with that person. Oh my goodness, shocking. Yeah, and so a lot of women are dating or in relationships with maybe their best friend, their best female friend. It doesn't mean that they're bisexual. It just means that they're on the spectrum. They're questioning or they're queer. That's it. It's on a spectrum. It doesn't mean you're fully engaged with the spectrum. So I saw a boomer woman. I won't mention who it was. When she saw the numbers of young females who are identifying as LGBTQIA+, she threw up her hands and she said, what is happening with all of our kids out here? I don't know. This is so shocking. This is so surprising. I said, well, it has to do a lot with you all's generation, what young people, especially young women, saw occurring in their household, what you allowed men to do to you, yeah, and didn't really push back. And younger women are like, you know, I don't necessarily want that to be the case for me. I don't blame them. Some of the things were pretty bad. We're not going to, yeah, we're not going to try to pretend like they were all like sunshine and rainbows here. I'm just saying. So, folks who are younger women tend to identify more on the spectrum, the queer spectrum, than younger men. It's not to say that younger men aren't queer. They just don't identify as being bisexual as much as younger women. The survey data did get to that, but didn't really explain it the way I'm explaining it to you. See, I'm breaking this shit down. You all, you all see data, and sometimes they try to explain it to you, but it goes over your head. I'm trying to break it down where it's simplistic. Very easy to understand. Yeah. The last point is this. Younger men don't necessarily want to be in relationships. Yeah. They're kind of immature. You know, you had these whole, outside of the Midtown movement, you had another big movement amongst young men. See, a lot of people don't think I know these things because we don't talk about it. But just because I don't talk about it doesn't mean I don't, I'm not fully aware of it. You had another movement transpire. This was the Passport Bros. Oh, you all don't think I know about the Passport Bros. So basically, these individuals are young men who have passports. And they travel to different countries hoping to meet women in foreign countries that'll go for their bullshit. Now this kind of game is really stale and worn out. It's played out. This was sort of kind of a 2018, 19, 2020 game. Because why? Why is it played out? Younger women from Western societies are traveling just as much as younger men. So you go to a foreign country and be like, I'm going to hit the jackpot. 
and a younger Western woman is going to the foreign country thinking, I'm going to hit the jackpot. And you goofies will run into each other overseas. Yeah. I'm having folks, I'm not going to tell you who, which country. I'm having folks tell me, you know, these Western goofies are over here in these countries clowning and misbehaving amongst each other, fighting, arguing, doing all kind of shit. I said, I'm not surprised we see it in our country. Yeah, so this has made it difficult for all of us who just want to enjoy traveling without all of this. I'm traveling to hook up and all of that kind of shit. You know, when we travel, we travel, you know, to explore, meet with the locals. I love exploring new cafes, personally. I love trying the hot chocolate. Sadly and tragically, I go to different zoos. I like to check in with the homies in different countries, see how they're treated. Sometimes I advise the people working at the zoos to take that animal out of that small cage and put it in the wild. You know, take the cage away. It's not going to fly away if you're feeding it. Yeah. What animal is going to try to escape if you're feeding it? Zero. And you don't need these small cages. I have to tell folks that at zoos. Like, stop putting these birds in these small cages. That's just sick. They're already in the zoo, in the prison. And you got them in these small little tiny cages. I said, this is disgusting. One time somebody got offended by it. Say, I don't care that you're offended by it. I'm offended that the animal is in there like that. Yeah, that's offensive to me. Yeah, you have to get down and talk to these humans the way they understand it. Sometimes you have to put your foot down on them. So there's a lot of reasons to travel. But these passport bros, and I guess now we can call them passport gals, they're traveling looking to hook up in relationships and then they're running into each other. It's the funniest thing ever. And they're going to blows with each other in foreign countries. I said, boy, oh boy. This is really why I try to avoid highly frequented touristy countries and spots and locations. I don't want to see you all. I know. You all are gonna say that's horrible. But if I wanted to be around you, I'd just be around you in the Western countries. I try to avoid you at all costs. Yeah. Because I don't want the drama. Western drama is ridiculous. It's not to say that Eastern folks are great and dandy either. It's just that they're not familiar with me, so they tend to be more well behaved. You all are too familiar, and familiarity breeds contempt. So anytime I see Americans, yeah, if I even detect Americans, I skedaddle. I'm like, boy, that's why I'm trying to travel, to get away from you clowns. I don't want to see you. Yeah, this is a fact. So I avoid most touristy areas when I travel. I almost never go to tourist overrun or overcrowded tourist areas. I hate it. Yeah. I don't want to see Americans. You know. I want to be as far and far away from them as possible. Period. British folks are obnoxious, but we've had good British folks. We've run into some good British folks. I've had a couple of French folks that are nice. I tell you who the best tourists are from Western countries. Generally, it's Germans. Generally, Germans are pretty fun when they travel. Yeah. Polish folks, I've had some real issues with the Polish. Yeah, I've had some real issues. I won't go into it, but they're not nice. 
when those folks travel, they're not necessarily nice. Germans really nice. The ones I've encountered. You all say, oh, that's representative of all Germans. I haven't encountered all Germans. So somebody will say they've had problems with German travelers as though that means I should have. I'm only talking about my experience here. Mine. Your experience is unique to you. And so these traveling folks going overseas, that's kind of played out. Folks are going overseas, getting into arguments and all of this, that, and the other. And really what's going to have to happen, young people, you're going to have to sit down, get together, have all of these discussions in one place, be willing to take criticism, unlike your adult parents who are not willing to hear what one side does, because I'm going to be honest, men do some things that are really atrocious, offensive, and women, you do some things that are really atrocious and offensive. So both of you goofies, you should sit down and have honest and open dialogue with each other about whatever the situation is. And it's not going to be perfect. Nothing ever is. But as long as you're going to have these kind of hateful rhetoric and discussions with one another, these numbers are not going to improve. They're only going to get worse. I'm being a realist with you. Yeah. Somebody said that'll be a good thing for the society. Well, division, no matter what it's based on, is never necessarily a productive and positive thing for the society. So even if I'm somebody that's really gun ho and I'm like, yeah, women are dating women and that's a good thing and men are douchey and scum, it's still going to cause division to have that open and out in the society. Yeah. So discussion is necessary. And both sides are going to have to be fair about their faults. You know, men, all of these men that were saying they were high value, that was a fair critique that women are like, well, you can't even stay erect. You can't stay hard. And then for him to say, that's all you women care about. Well, that's all men really care about, too. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's kind of important. What she brought up was important. And that goes to health. Both men and women, both of you goofies, are not really in the best of health. I mean, women are a little bit more healthier. But the average age of an American woman is 79. The average age and life expectancy of a man is 73. That's a six-year age difference for women over men, but that's not by much more. So there's going to have to be tampered and realistic expectations. You know, I saw somebody, and I won't mention who, and she said, I'm not willing to date a bus driver. And the other woman said, I would date a bus driver. And you know, some of the women were like, well, she came across as a big Misha because she admitted that she would date a bus driver. But you all, come on now. To say all bus drivers are not worthy, it's a good paying job. It's somebody hard at work. And yes, it's true. You don't want people to just settle into mediocrity. So I could understand it both ways. And that's why those conversations are necessary. Because sometimes it's not the case that one person is right and the other person is completely wrong. Or vice versa. Sometimes there can be truth in both things. But it's when we broadly generalize that we can get into trouble. So to say, I wouldn't date a bus driver, me personally, I wouldn't necessarily say that. 
because it could be the case that there is a bus driver that I would somehow date. I don't know the consequences or the reasons why. So you never also want to close off an avenue. Young people, you listen to me. This is very important. And this is something that a lot of dating experts and gurus don't tell you. Never just close off an avenue. Say that you wouldn't do something. You know, they used to say, never say never. Because you never know what the situation might be. Yeah. And if you disparage and say, I'm not going to do this, and it turns out later on down the road that it is something that is feasible for you, you kind of already put that roadblock in your mind. And you might turn away from something that really is beneficial to you. So that's why I always put the caveat that it's not for me right now, but it could be for me sometime down the road. That's a safe way of hedging. You got to be able to hedge in the society. I'm telling young people what's necessary for them to thrive. Forget some of you adults. You can't teach an old dog a new trick. But this is for the youth. This is for their betterment. That's why I'm doing this. So you never want to close off an avenue completely. Yeah, you never want to say never. And any of these adults that are saying that, in my humble opinion, they're inaccurate for saying that. You can say it's not for me now and that's fine. And that's fake. But I never would want to say, I never would date a teacher. You have to be the principal or own and operate a school. Mm, you know, I don't know about that. So we have to be very careful. Because oftentimes, sometimes, we will see someone in the society and they could be a good match for us. But we've already put these notions in our mind. And sometimes your mind subconsciously works against you. You've told your mind, be opposed to that. And so even if it's a good fit, your mind will go back and regurgitate what you previously told it. It's like a program, yeah. So you got to be very careful what you put into it. Yeah. This is for young people. Not for some of you adults who are very close-minded. Yeah. Rigidity. Rigidity is something always to look out for. It's not to say that everything is for you. you know? I'm not one of these adults that tell you, well, every cup of tea is for you. No, that's not true. But you have to be cautious against rigidity, too. You have to be flexible and nimble in this society. Somebody will say there's plenty of fish in all the oceans and seas. Okay, that's true. Nine billion people, eight billion people on the planet. But how many of those billions of people are you going to personally have an experience with in the course of your lifetime in this realm. See, now be realistic. I think the average person, I don't have any data to back this up, but the average person probably will only truly have meaningful interactions with maybe a couple of thousand people in their lifetime. And by meaningful interactions, I mean that's maybe going to a grocery store and speaking with somebody maybe a neighbor, maybe a family member. Yeah, you don't have meaningful interactions with millions of people. So this notion that there's plenty of fish in the sea as though everything is available to you, this is where dating apps sort of kind of messed up the fabric and thinking of the general society. You know, when dating was something that was feasible and tangible to people, they only had limited options. They didn't create these applications like Tinder, where the radius, you can expand the radius 20 miles outside of where you live. 
25 miles outside of where you live. Okay, that's all fine and dandy. But then it just feels sort of superficial and nonsensical and mindless. Because you're scanning and browsing people that live very, very far away from you. Suppose you match and the person lives 50 miles away from you. Are you really going to travel 50 miles to be in that relationship? One person is going to probably have to more or less move closer to the other person, right? If you want it to be a sustainable and maintainable relationship. So yes, you have a plethora of options. But where is the radius? Where is the balance and radius? How close are you going to be to the person in proximity? See, we have to take all of those kinds of things into calculation. And they don't often tell you these things. That's why I'm telling you all this. This is for the wider society. It's not for now, it's for later. They always say that. People don't understand that, but they will. I thought it prudent to tell you all this, to come on and explain this to you. And maybe a lot of you won't understand it now. And that's fine, and that's understandable. But I think a lot of people will enjoy it, for sure.